It is now time for oral questions, and I recognize the Leader of the Official Opposition. Thank you, Speaker. Thank you, Speaker. And um, just uh, quickly before I start, I want to congratulate everyone who participated in the municipal elections across the province yesterday. And congratulate those who were victorious and thank those who put their names forward. Uh, my question is to the Deputy Premier. Later today, the Minister of Labour will be making an announcement with the Minister of Economic Development, and we know that this government has been holding backroom meetings concerning Ontario's Employment Standards Act and their plans to take away some basic job benefits from everyday people. Can the Deputy Premier tell us what this government plans to take away? Deputy Premier. The government House Leader. Government House Leader. Thanks very much, Speaker, and I too would like to uh, congratulate everyone that participated in the municipal elections across the province last night. It's very humbling uh, when you win an election and everybody who puts their name on a ballot should be given credit for doing that and putting their name out there. So congratulations to everyone. <laughs> Mr. Speaker, to the member opposite, the people of Ontario gave us a very, very strong mandate on June 7th to make some difference in the province of Ontario, to make sure that we opened Ontario up for business. And I can tell you that the Minister of Economic Development, the Minister of Labour, and the other ministers who are making that announcement today have done province-wide consultations, meeting with employers, employees, other stakeholders to ensure that we get this right. The NDP can yeah. defend the status quo, which was driving jobs out of Ontario. I can tell you that Premier Ford and the Ontario PC government will be bringing good Paying jobs back to Ontario. Stop the clock. Restart the clock. Supplementary. Well, Speaker, currently in Ontario, a woman fleeing domestic violence is able to take a few days off work to help organize her life and support her children without fear of losing her job. The Premier indicated that he's opposed to that. Yep. Will we hear a commitment to protect women hoping to make time, take Order. time away from work after fleeing domestic violence, Speaker, or is that right? A right that this government plans to take away from women fle fleeing of domestic violence. Government House Leader. Thanks very much, Mr. Speaker. And uh, the member opposite is completely wrong in making those assertions. As a matter of fact, the Premier Once of Ontario again. is standing up for women across the province. He's standing up for yeah. everyday people yeah. in Ontario. Yeah. Most importantly, Mr. Speaker, what you're going to hear today from those ministers is the key to unlocking Ontario's economic oh, potential. There was a time, Mr. Speaker, there was a time not so long ago before the liberal era of darkness that Ontario was the economic engine of Canada. We are committed to putting that big sign up on the border saying Ontario is open for business. Today's announcement by those ministers is going to be the first step in ensuring that Ontario regains its proper place as the engine of Canada's economy. Order. Start the clock. Final supplementary. Thank you, Speaker. Currently in Ontario, a working person can actually take a sick day off without fear of losing their job. The Premier has indicated he's opposed to that. Is that a right that the government plans to take? Order. Right? Government House Leader. Speaker. The member of the official opposition, the leader of the official opposition, continues day after day after day to make false assertions and make it up as she goes along. I can tell you. And ask the member to withdraw. Happy to withdraw. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Day, the disastrous liberal policies of the past are being defended by the member Shame. opposite. Shame. We will not defend Enabler. those disastrous liberal policies that have driven good paying jobs, I'm jobs that had benefits out of the province. It's our commitment, and we were given a strong mandate by the people of Ontario on June 7th to put Ontario back on track yeah. to create good paying jobs with benefits in the province of Ontario, and that's what we're going to do, Mr. Yeah, Speaker. Yeah, yeah. Next question, Leader of the Opposition. Uh, thank you, Speaker. My next question is uh, for the Deputy Premier, but I have to say I will absolutely stand in this place and defend workers' rights to earn a decent living and have a decent pay and a right to time off every chance I get, Speaker. Every 
In January, the minimum wage was scheduled to rise by a dollar an hour. The Premier has Order. indicated he, he's opposed to that, even though he has no problem yeah. handing a $75,000 pay increase Order. to one of his friends. Is the government planning to freeze the pay of workers earning minimum wage? Speaker? Deputy Premier. To government House Leader. Government House Leader. Mr. Speaker, I can tell you that on June the 7th, the people of Ontario spoke loud and clear. They handed over the keys to the Premier's office to Doug Ford to bring in big changes to Ontario's workplace and our employment. You know what, Mr. Speaker? We are committed to making Ontario open for business, and the NDP continue to defend the harmful policies of the Liberals that drove jobs out of Ontario. In the month after Bill 148 became law, we saw 60,000 jobs leave the province. The only jobs that were being created in Ontario after Bill 148 were part-time jobs. That's what the NDP are defending here today. We are going to defend workers. We are going to ensure that they have good-paying jobs with good benefits, better jobs than the part-time jobs that the NDP and the Liberals are standing up for. Mr. Speaker. We're going to open Ontario for business. Open for business. Start the clock. Supplementary. Speaker, in August, two months after this government got elected, 80,000 jobs were lost in the province of Ontario. You know, working women and men are worried that they are about to lose their rights on the job. An increase in the minimum wage, the ability to actually take a vacation, and the right to take time off work to help their kids after leaving a situation of domestic violence. The Premier said he plans to take those rights away. Can the Acting Look Premier explain Bond, why working women and men don't deserve those kinds of rights in a province like Ontario in the year 2018? Mr. Speaker, I'd like to thank the Leader of the Official Opposition for making our points for here, us here. this morning. In the month after we became the government of Ontario, 80,000 jobs were lost. And you know why? It was because of the harmful, disastrous policies Press of the Liberal on. government that you supported 97 out of the You should be ashamed of yourself. Those lost jobs are on your back. Not ours. We're going to fix the problem, Mr. Speaker. We're going to fix that problem, and I can tell you that what the ministers will be announcing today is going to go a long way to ensuring that we get Ontario back on track to make it the economic engine of Canada once again. After consultations from every corner of the province by our Minister of Economic Development and his parliamentary assistants, we've had great feedback Response. from employers employees, stakeholders, working families. We need to get Ontario back on track. We want you to support us. Stop the clock. Stop the clock. Order. Order. Start the clock. Final supplementary. Thank you, Speaker. Well, it's becoming more and more clear whose side this government is on. The worker on minimum wage doesn't deserve. The government benches have to come to order. I have to be able to hear the leader of the opposition. Leader of the opposition. The minimum wage in the province of Ontario doesn't deserve a one dollar an hour raise, but the premier's friends deserve patronage posts with six-figure salaries and seventy-five thousand dollar raises. Speaker, the protections the premier's planning to scrap are not luxuries; they are basic necessities that provide people with a dignified, decent quality of life as workers in this province. And in fact, they're basic dignities that every working person should have a right to expect. Does the Deputy Premier truly believe that women who take time away from work to look after their kids after fleeing domestic violence should have to worry about losing their job? Mr. Speaker, I wish the Leader of the Official Opposition would at least wait until the announcement is made Enough later today fear before she fearmongers. Because I can tell you that she is so far off base. She's so far off base, but that's the character of what we've seen so far from the leader of the official opposition. I I'm going to ask the member to withdraw. 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 
Speaker, after consultations with employers and employees and all kinds of stakeholders in the agriculture, small business sector, we're standing up for people of Ontario. We are here for the people. The people sent us here to ensure that we get Ontario back on track. People deserve good paying jobs. All we've seen created over the last number of months are part-time jobs, thanks to you enabling the Liberal government for the last 15 years. Stop the clock. I'm going to remind the members that uh, the debate need not be personal. Make your comments through the chair. Order. Start the clock. Next question. Leader of the Opposition. Thank you, Speaker. My next question is for the Minister of Health. Families have been, who have been forced to watch loved ones suffer in hospital hallways while waiting for treatment or who had to scrape their savings together to pay for take-home cancer medication know that every cut to health care makes their lives a little bit harder. But since the election, the Minister of Health has already begun to warn hospitals that they will have to prepare for even more cuts. People gathered on the lawn at Queen's Park today uh, have a simple question for the Minister of Health. How does the minister think that cutting health care funding will actually clear crowded hospital hallways? Minister of Health and Long Term Care. First of all, I have to say to the Leader of the Official Opposition, I disagree with your basic premise. What we are trying to do is augment health care. We got right. elected to end hallway health care. That is what we're working on. That's why we made the announcement two weeks ago that we're putting $90 million more into creating 1,100 new spaces to get us through flu seasons while we create a health capacity plan, while we've created 6,000 long-term care bed spaces to try and alleviate the stress that hospitals are feeling because they have people in, their, in the hospitals, alternate level of care patients, that don't have anywhere else to go. So we've got to work with hospitals. We have to work with long-term care owners and facilitators to make sure that we can clear that. We also made an announcement yesterday about consumption and treatment services. We want to make sure that people who have addiction problems are going to be able to get the help they need. That is what we are doing. We are building on our health yeah. Start the clock. Supplementary. Uh, we, on this side of the house, we believe the people of Ontario should own their health care systems, sure. not private interests. Look, the, the minister is correct. They shorted Ontario hospitals by $10 million, uh, less than what the Liberals invested in flu surge funding. We know that that's the case. Families want to know, though, that when a loved one needs to visit the hospital, they won't be stuck in a hallway, that their parents can find that long-term care bed that they need, and that they can afford the drugs that they need when they're ill. Instead, the Premier is promising $6 billion in cuts and speaking warmly about the role that the private sector can play in our health care system, where everyday people won't be able to afford to pay their way to the front of the line, although Conservative friends will make a lot of profits off of that, and their friends will be able to afford to pay their way. So will the minister uh, reject those failed schemes of Question. privatization and cuts and commit to investing in a stronger public health care system for our province? For health. Well, once again, I vigorously disagree with the premise of the well, question. We are building on our Medicine. We've already taken steps in that direction. We're committing $3.8 billion in order to create a comprehensive and connected mental health and addiction system. We were elected for the, by the people for the people. Yeah. I'm reluctant. Stop the clock. I'm reluctant to interrupt a member who has the floor, but once the standing ovation starts and your member still has the floor and still speaking, I cannot hear her. That's why I stood up to interrupt her, just so you know. Start the clock. Next question. The member for Mississauga Streetsville. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. My question is for the Minister of Environment, Conservation and Parks. Speaker. The federal government has made it clear that they intend to put, impose an unwanted, unnecessary and unaffordable carbon tax on the people of Ontario. 
This intention shows that they have a complete disregard for what impact this carbon tax will have on the hard-working people of Ontario. When speaking with my constituents, it is clear that they are fearful of what this tax will mean to them and their families. Can the minister explain to the people of Ontario what our government is doing to make their life more affordable? Yeah. Minister of the Environment, Conservation and Parks. Mr. Speaker, through you to the member from Mississauga Streetsville, thank you for that question. Of course, we await the Prime Minister's announcement later today, but, uh, but the member is quite correct. The Financial Accountability Officer uh, last week answered the question. $648 per family by 2022. That's the cost of Justin Trudeau's tax. Uh, this is a cost that Ontario families simply cannot afford to pay. And it's uh, a cost that our government was elected, unlike the opposition, our government was elected to ensure didn't happen. Yep. Uh, well, the first thing that we did was bring forward Bill 4. One of the first things we did was bring forward Bill 4. That bill has now made its way through committee. That bill will get rid of the previous government's uh, cap-and-trade program. Um, that will put $260 in the pockets of Ontarians. And we've already seen a reduction in gas prices, and that is the beginning. Spons. It will eventually be a $0.10 cent reduction in gas prices. Yeah. But this But this government is Thank you. Supplementary. Speaker, I thank the minister for his answer and, more importantly, the hard work he and his team are putting towards making life more affordable in Ontario. I know my constituents are very pleased to finally have a government that is working for them and not simply acting in favour of their own agenda. However, the federal government threatens to impose a job-killing carbon tax in Ontario should we not present a plan that they believe meets their own objective. This threat makes the people of my riding wonder what's in store for them. They are concerned that the fight we've had to rid this province of the cap-and-trade carbon tax was all for nothing. If the Trudeau carbon tax is imposed on our province, can the minister explain what the implications will be? Minister. Mr. Speaker, and we, we wait to hear the Prime Minister's comments later today, but, but what seems to be clear is that regardless of a plan, we have six provinces, uh, NDP governments, Liberal governments, Conservative governments. Uh, we have provinces that have had plans for a long time, our own plan coming forward. But regardless of a plan, this seems to be a government that's intent on putting a cost on Ontario families and the Canadian families, $648 a year by 2022. That's the equivalent of four hydro bills, Mr. Speaker. Ontarios can't afford that, and that's why this government will do everything in its power, along with other governments, to fight the Trudeau carbon tax to make sure that we don't go back to the kind of regressive, job-killing approach of the previous government. Here, here, here. Next question, the member for Beaches, East York. Thank you, Speaker. My question is for the Acting Premier. For 13 years under the previous government, the minimum wage was stuck, but the minimum wage had been stagnant since the previous Conservative government froze it in 1995, creating generations of working poor in this province. Why is this increasing the minimum wage is not only the right thing to do, but has proven good for the economy? Why is this government ignoring the mountain of evidence that increasing the minimum wage to $15 an hour puts money in the pockets of those who need it most, who in turn can afford to buy the goods and services which then feeds our economy? Deputy Premier. Well, thanks very much. And uh, to the member opposite, there, there clearly is not a mountain of evidence. Actually, the mountain of evidence shows that uh, we're actually losing jobs because of the increase. The Canadian Federation of Independent Business said it was too much, too fast. And that's why we're going to put a pause on an increase to the minimum wage. I have quotes from all the members opposite here, not all of them, but a number of the members opposite who agreed. They said the same thing in this House, that if you are going to increase the minimum wage, that it should be done gradually. It should be predictable. It should be sustainable so that we don't break the backs of small business and cost people their jobs, which is what we've seen over the last year that Bill 148 has been in place. I can quote a number of the members over there, but what we've seen is lost jobs and lost hours as a result Response. of the increase. Supplementary. 
Speaker, minimum wage workers don't need a job. They have a job. In fact, as the members of this House have heard over and over again, they often have two or even three jobs. And they require those multiple jobs in order to survive. So instead of $2,000 more in the pockets of low-income workers through the minimum wage increase, the Premier promises less in a tax break that most minimum wage workers won't even qualify for. Why? Does this government insist on taking this province backwards? Why does not this government think that 1.7 million workers deserve a raise? Government House Leader. Speaker, uh, and, and again to the member opposite, uh, what we want to create in Ontario is an Ontario that creates good paying jobs. Ontarians. What we've seen under the Liberals, supported by the NDP, is a huge increase in part time jobs. So the member opposite, who says that people are working one, two, and three part time jobs at minimum wage, we want those people to have one good job yeah, yeah. with a good, yeah, yeah. With good pay yeah, yeah. and good benefits. And I can tell you, Mr. Speaker, that our government, in the 120 days that we've been government, has started to create the environment for real, positive, good-paying jobs. Yeah, yeah. We've ended the cap-and-trade scheme. We've lowered electricity rates. And today we're going to be creating an environment to bring manufacturing jobs, good-paying jobs, back to Ontario where they belong. Stop the clock. Stop the clock. Order. Yeah. <laughs> Order. Start the clock. Next question. The member for Mississauga Centre. Mr. Speaker, good morning. My question is for the Minister of Environment, Conservation and Parks. The Liberal cap and trade carbon tax has hurt Ontario families and has made life unaffordable. The people of Ontario need a government that listens to their concerns. Ontarians look forward to a time when they no longer have to worry about how long they can make their gas tanks last or if they'll be able to put money to put food on the table. The minister introduced legislation to remove this crippling cap and trade carbon tax. Mr. Speaker, can the minister update all taxpayers how they will benefit from the elimination of Ontario's crippling Cap and trade carbon tax. Minister of the Environment, Conservation and Parks. Mr. Mr. Speaker, thank you to the member from Mississauga Centre for her question. Our government was elected on a commitment to make life more affordable for Ontario families. An important part of that commitment was eliminating the regressive job-killing cap-and-trade carbon tax of the Liberal government. And as the member notes, we have made another step through that process, through the committee process, uh, to seeing the, uh, the passing of Bill 4, which will eliminate that, uh, that, that tax. We have already seen, however, Mr. Mr. Speaker, a 4.6% reduction in the price of gasoline, 5.7 cent reduction in the price of diesel fuel. This is just the beginning, Mr. Speaker, just the beginning of putting more money in people's pockets and making sure that Ontarians get the benefits of what they earn and making sure that this kind of tax doesn't impose on Ontario families. Thank you. Supplementary. Thank you, Mr. Speaker, and I thank the minister for the answer. The people of this province have been held back for too long and deserve to have money put back into their pockets. With the continuous commentary from the federal government admitting that their carbon tax could lead to job losses, residents of my riding have raised their concerns about the unclear direction of the federal government's position on their own tax. They are unsettled by the possibility that the province rids itself of the carbon tax to simply have another one forced upon them. Mr. Speaker, can the minister assure us that actions are in place to do everything that can be done to avoid yet, an, yet another regressive and job-killing tax to be imposed on the hard-working Ontario families? Minister. Mr. Speaker, I thank the member for, for her question. Again, we were elected not just to get rid of the cap-and-trade program, but there was another commitment from, from our Premier, Mr. Speaker. It was a commitment to use all the tools at our disposal to fight the imposition of Justin Trudeau's carbon tax. Here, here. Now, 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 now
Now we wait, we wait, Mr. Speaker, to, to hear, uh, hear the Prime Minister's announcement. But, Mr. Speaker, we know that a majority of provinces oppose the federal plan. We've been asking since August to work with the federal government, to have a conversation, to talk about a plan, to talk about a way of hitting the targets they want to hit, but to work together and not impose a, killing, a job killing tax. What have we heard, Mr. Speaker? We've heard crickets. So we'll wait to hear what the Prime Minister says this morning. But, Mr. Speaker, be assured, this province will use all the tools at its disposal to stand up against the federal government imposing an unconstitutional, job killing, regressive carbon tax. Next question, member for Toronto, Danforth. Speaker, thanks. Uh, my question to the Minister of the Environment, Conservation and Parks. Later today, the Prime Minister will be unveiling the federal plan to impose a new carbon price in Ontario. The Conservative government's actions on climate so far will increase the deficit by $3 billion, and it seems like the net result will be families paying more, no plan to combat climate change, and handing control to the government in Ottawa. Is this the government's idea of success? <laughs> Minister of the Environment, Conservation and Parks. Mr. Speaker, I thank the member from Davenport for his question. And clearly, the opposition understand um, policy the same way that the Prime Minister understands that. They think it's good to take money out of the pockets of families. Yeah. When we talk about $3 billion less out of the pockets of families, that's what we're about, Mr. Speaker. We're about putting money back into people's pockets. We are about trying to make sure that they can afford the things that they want in their life while we put forward a constructive, balanced climate plan. So, Mr. Speaker, if the, mem if the opposition wants to line up with Justin Trudeau and take as much money as they can, as they can get away with, to pay for their programs and big government, we're happy to let them do it. Doug Ford and this government will be fighting for families and fighting climate change. Stop the clock. Restart the clock. Supplementary. Thank you, Speaker. And back to the minister. Um, an interesting minister who supports the expansion of the deficit, but let's set that aside for the moment. Premier Ford has become an expert at losing lawsuits. An expert. And the people of Ontario are stuck paying the price. $30 million in this case. He's increasing the deficit by $3 billion not to have a climate plan. And while Ontario families will be paying the same or even more, it's Ottawa who will now be in control of how that money's spent. Does the minister believe he's effectively standing up for Ontario? Minister. <laughs> M M Mr. Speaker, Mr. Speaker, coming from a party that supported the previous government, that has created the tragic financial situation of a $15 billion deficit, yeah. it is really hard to take financial advice from a party that has a $7 billion poll in their, in their platform. Order. But, but Mr. Speaker, Mr. Speaker, we'll stand in this House all day and talk about putting money back into families' pockets. And that's because we're confident that the plan that we'll bring forward, yep. a plan that will balance the economy and the environment, will reduce greenhouse gases, will prepare Ontario for climate change, but will not punish Ontario families the way the NDP and the member opposite want to. Here, here. Next question, the member for Scarborough Guildwood. Thank you, Speaker. My question is to the Deputy Premier. Deputy Premier, is $15 an hour barely a living wage for the people of Toronto and people in my riding of Scarborough Guildwood too much to ask? Is two paid leave days, if you or your child is sick, too much to ask? Is counting on compensation when your shift is cancelled too much to ask? Is equal pay for equal work too much to ask? What is your explanation to women who are fleeing violence or domestic abuse, who may use these protections to better their situation and to protect themselves and their children. If you had two paid sick days a year and the government was taking them away, how would you feel? Deputy Premier. The government house leader. Government house leader. 
Well, uh, thanks uh, to the member opposite for the question this morning. Uh, what I would advise the member opposite to do is wait until uh, we announce our changes this morning. I know that the Premier and the Minister of Economic Development and Trade and the Minister of Labour and the Minister for Training Colleges and Universities have been working for the last four months to put together a comprehensive plan on how we can right the wrongs that were created by the member that opposite government. and the Liberal government over the last 15 years, wrongs that have cost. Ontario, 300,000 manufacturing jobs, wrongs that have cost people on minimum wage hours at their jobs, wrongs that have actually cost people on minimum wage their jobs entirely. What we are going to be unveiling today is a plan on how we can open Ontario for business so that everyone in Ontario can thrive, so that we can bring back a future for our kids and our grandkids. Here, Thank here. You. Stop the clock. Start the clock. Supplementary. Mr. Speaker, our kids and our grandkids need a government that takes their jobs seriously and grows Ontario's economy, not take it backwards. I want, I want the member opposite to know that since 2003, Ontario's economy has grown by $338 billion. So this economy that you have inherited is a robust economy. In fact, this economy has regained all the jobs that were lost since the Great Recession, almost 800,000 jobs, in fact. But what exactly are you repealing today? We know a person's income is a key determinant of health. It's one of the social determinants of health. Your government is cutting, cutting Question. social assistance rates, cancelling basic income, cutting wages, and slashing employment protections that workers need. These people need government to provide Thank you. Thank you. Government House Leader. Oh boy. Uh, speaker, to the member opposite. She seems, seems to think that everything is just fine in Ontario. But I can tell you that the people of Ontario strongly disagreed with that member and the policies of the government that she represented for the past 15 years in this province, a government that drove 300,000 manufacturing jobs out of the province, a Liberal government that gave up on manufacturing, Mr. Speaker. We believe that we can bring those jobs back to Ontario. We believe that we can create the environment again for good-paying jobs in Ontario, where people don't have to go from job to job on minimum wage, where people can support their families with a real living wage, a living wage that includes benefits, that eliminates the debt Response. and the deficit that this member and that government created over the last 15 years. We can do better. We're going to unlock Ontario's potential. Thank you. Stop the clock. Next question. Member for Mississauga East Cooksville, start the call. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. My question is for the Minister of Environment, Conservation and Parks. Every day, members of the opposition rise in this House with concerns on how the people of Ontario will provide for their families. We have heard countless of arguments from all parties that lead to the same conclusion. The people of Ontario need life to be more affordable. Our government believes that the people of Ontario deserve to have an affordable province to live in. They should not have to worry about ineffective taxes and rising costs. They should not have to worry about jobs being pushed out of this province because business is cheaper elsewhere. Mr. Speaker, can the minister share with us what steps that have been taken to make life more affordable for the people of Ontario? Minister of the Environment. 
Conservation and Parks. Mr. Speaker, and thank you, the member from Mississauga East Cooksville, for that question. To be fair, all of the parties in this legislature advocated for affordability, but unlike the opposition, our party is taking real action to put money into family pockets. We know what life in Ontario looks like under a carbon tax or under cap and trade. It's about families with less money. The Auditor General, Mr. Speaker, spoke about the regressive nature of this tax, that low and middle income families get hit the most because, of course, they spend the most percent, highest percentage of their income on, on energy and heating. We know that businesses have been leaving this province, in part because of high energy costs and cap and trade and a carbon tax will just put them further. Our government remains committed to making sure that this is a good place to have a business, this is a good place to raise a family, that we put more money in families' pockets, that we support our job creators, sure. and we do that by standing in opposition Response. to cap and trade, and we do that by standing in opposition to Justin Trudeau's carbon tax. Yeah. Yeah. Supplementary. Thank you, Speaker, and I thank the Minister for the answer. In our efforts, we have one clear goal in mind. Under the leadership of our Premier, we intend to make life in Ontario more affordable. The concern of affordability is not the only issue we hear in this House. In numerous instances, we have also heard concern of how our province is being impacted by climate change. The threat is real. This province faces the true possibility of the effects of climate change increased forest fires and storms that cause floods and loss of power are just some examples. Mr. Speaker, can the minister share with us his plans to address these concerns and improve our Question. environment for future generations? Minister. Mr. Speaker, thank you. Thank you to the member for the question. Climate change, as, as I've said, as the Premier says, does represent a serious threat. It's a threat to, to our way of life. It is a threat to our land, to our water, to locally grown food. And let me be clear, the government is very committed to fighting it. Mr. Speaker, we are currently getting, getting information, getting consultations. I'd encourage anyone who is interested going to www.ontario.ca backslash climate change to provide us with that fee feedback. Um, we need a plan for climate change that will both prepare Ontarians and will make sure that we reduce greenhouse gases, but we need one that doesn't punish Ontario families. We need a plan that is sensible and that Ontarians can buy into, not like the previous cap-and-trade program, not like Justin Trudeau's carbon tax, but a balanced plan that balances our economy, balances our environment, is good for Ontario, good for its environment, and good for Ontario families. Start the clock. The next question, member for Niagara Centre. My question is to the Minister of Health and Long-Term Care. Speaker, I recently met with staff from the Hotel du Shaver, a health and rehabilitation centre in my riding. For over a decade, they've been fighting for a planning grant to expand the facility with, with 65 additional beds. The Shaver was successful when the province announced a $500,000 planning grant this past May. The Hotel du Shaver has been in the dark on the status of this grant since the new government took office, and they need to know whether or not they can expect the money so they can begin planning for years to come. Can the minister provide the people of Niagara with an update as to the status of the Hotel du Shaver planning grant? Mr. Health and Long Term Care. Well, thank you very much for the question, and I'm sure the member can appreciate there was a period of time before the election, shortly after the election, when things were. Uh, frozen, nothing was able to happen. We are working right now with people on the uh, capital side within the Ministry of Health. We hope to have answers out to, I've received a number of inquiries from a number of members, but we are working very hard on getting that information to people so that they can continue with their planning and continue with their operations. So I'd be able to speak to you more specifically about the hospital within your riding, but I can assure all members that we are working on that um, with uh, expediency as much as possible to get people the answers that they need. Supplementary. Speaker, rehabilitation services like those offered at the Shaver are the solution to many problems that plague our health care system. Rehabilitation can optimize a patient's ability to live independently at home, keep patients out of long-term care, reduce their length of stays in our hospitals, and increase the quality of life for patients. Expanding investment into rehabilitation centers like the Shaver 
provides a multifaceted policy solution that fits into this government's stated goals and objectives. So will the minister review this file and complete the final steps in order to ensure that health care and patient needs are prioritized in Niagara by following through with this much-needed grant? Minister. Thank you. I can certainly assure you that I will be looking into this situation, and I do agree with you that rehabilitation services form an essential part of recovery for many people in Ontario, both occupational therapy, speech therapy, physiotherapy. Um, all of these uh, services are essential, but of course, there's only so much one can do with the situation that we inherited, quite frankly, where very little was done over 15 years, and we've got a bit of a, a, a difficult situation with hallway health care, with no real action on mental health and addictions, no real action on rehabilitation services. So there's a lot of work to be done, but absolutely, yes, I will look into your situation uh, with respect to the Shaver and get back to you. Next question, the member for Durham. Thank you, Speaker. My, my question is for the Minister of Finance. Our Minister of Health just talked about the situation we inherited. Well, yesterday, the Select Committee on Financial Transparency heard from the, the three commissioners of the Independent Financial Commission of Inquiry. It was sobering to hear them review the findings of their report. They expressed shock. They expressed frustration, and they expressed concern for the future of our province. As we continue to learn more about the previous Liberal, Liberal government's practices, it's clear that accountability and trust were nowhere to be seen. Could the minister please inform the House and my constituents in Durham of some of the key aspects of the commissioner's testimony yesterday? Minister of Finance. Thank you, uh, Speaker, and thank you to the member from Durham for the question. Uh, we thank uh, Gordon Campbell, Dr. Al Rosen, and Michael Horgan for their important work preparing the Commission's report. They worked tirelessly to provide the people of Ontario a true accounting of the government's books, and what they found has concerned us all. The $15 billion deficit that was stashed off the government's books put our future in jeopardy. Former BC Premier Campbell put it best yesterday when he said, you can't build a future off of deficits. As the Select Committee on Financial Order. Transparency continues to learn the extent of the Liberal waste scandal, one message is clear. We need to take action. Restoring Spons. accountability and trust through the Select Committee Absolutely is right. exactly the right place to start. Supplementary. Thank you, Speaker. It's alarming to hear the evidence that the Liberals improperly mortgaged the future of our children and our grandchildren. And there's more. The Select Committee has heard how the Liberals shut out the Auditor General, how they ignored the warnings of senior public servants, and how they took st steps to compromise the future prosperity of our province. And what do Ontarians have to show for it? Well, a massive deficit and skyrocketing debt. What a reward. Could the minister please shed some light on what exactly the Liberals accomplished by trading the future of our province in exchange for short-term political gain? Minister. Thank you, uh, Speaker. Well, what the Liberals accomplished is uh, trading away our future, Speaker. Yesterday, the committee heard, quote, we're in worse situation now than we were in 2008. Speaker, the Liberals have left us a worse financial footing than we had during the last recession. For 15 years, the Liberals' tax and spend policies dug us into a financial hole. Former BC Premier Campbell gave the committee some advice yesterday. He said, quote, you can't get out of the hole until you stop digging. Referring to the Liberals, he said they used a backhoe in 2017. Wow. Well, Speaker, it's time to stop digging. It's time to clean up this mess. It's time to restore accountability and trust and put Ontario back on track as the economic engine of Canada. Order. 
Start the clock. Next question, the member for Temiskaming Cochrane. My question is to the Minister of Health and Long-Term Care. The Assistive Devices Program helps people with long-term physical disabilities pay for customized equipment like wheelchairs. To access the program, the client must have an evaluation done by either an occupational therapist or a physiotherapist. Typically, right after the evaluation, the device provider orders equipment and as soon as it arrives, provides it to the client. Typically, the turnaround program with the Ministry of Health is six weeks before the provider of the equipment gets the funds. Currently, it's six months. Uh -oh. So the providers who are providing this equipment, a lot of them are at risk of going out of business. Instead of being open for business, in this case, you're actually closing the businesses that provide, provide essential services to our people. What is the purpose of the lag, Premier? Mr. Health and Long-Term Care. I'm, well, thank you very much for the question. I am certainly aware of the issue. Of course, we want to make sure that the appropriate analysis is done to make sure that the equipment is required. If there is a longer period than what is usual, then it's something that we are looking into and we're going to try and reduce that time lag both for the person who needs the service as well as the person who's providing it to make sure that they get paid for it. So there is work to be done. It is something that we're aware of in the ministry, and we're trying to lessen that time lag. Supplementary. Thank you, and I'd like to thank you, the minister, for the answer. But one of the store owners in my riding got this response from the minister when he asked the question. Because they're saying, well, it's the, it's the store owner's fault because they're pre-supplying. So they should just wait for approval. So, and the service manager from this program says, it doesn't make, and I quote, it doesn't make financial sense to pre-supply chairs and equipment. What if a client gets a new wheelchair from a supplier right away, and then in four weeks the client dies? That was from the ministry. Wow. My mother is in a wheelchair, and I can pay for it, but there are millions of people or thousands of people in this province who can't. So do you agree with that statement? Who cares? If the client, as long as the client doesn't die in four weeks, they need those chairs right away. The ministry used to be able to do it in six weeks. Why can't the government of the, for the people do it in six weeks? Why does it take six months? Minister. As I indicated in an earlier answer, we got elected by the people for the people. So patient safety and patient needs are of utmost concern to us. We want to make sure that people are going to get both the drugs that they need, the treatment they need, and the equipment they need in a timely manner. And that applies whatever stage they are in their life. They deserve and expect to have that treatment, and we are going to deliver it to them. Can we delay the time lag? Yes. Will people get the equipment, though? Absolutely, yes, they will. Order. 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 Member for Timmins, come to order. Order. Start the clock. Next question, the member for Flamborough Landry. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. My question today is for the Minister of Community Safety and Correctional Services. Speaker, residents in my riding of Flamborough Glanbrook continue to raise concerns regarding the province's ability to keep our communities and streets safe while convicted terrorists are waiting in foreign prisons to return to this province. Speaker, the Trudeau government has failed to act. The safety of the public is and has always been one of our government's top priorities. Here, here. Ontarians who choose to participate in acts of violence against their country and their province do not deserve to return and be welcomed with open arms. Yep. Minister, could you please update the members of this legislature on what our government for the people is doing to ensure that convicted terrorists are punished for their reprehensible crimes? Minister of Community Safety and Correctional Services. Thank you. thank you, Mr. Speaker, and I want to thank the member for Flamborough Glanbrook for that question. And I also want to wish her a happy birthday today. Oh, 
Mr. Speaker, I want to again thank and commend the member from Peterborough, Peterborough uh, Kawartha, for his action and dedication to this file and for having taken the necessary steps to ensure that the Terrorist Activities Sanctions Act could be brought before the Legislature yesterday afternoon. Mr. Speaker, those who have chosen to leave this great province to take up arms with terrorist organizations and commit barbaric acts of violence against our men and women in uniform, civilians and our allies, need to know that we will not be welcoming them with open arms. The men and women of our armed forces and the great people of this province Pots. deserve to know that our government is listening and taking action. Supplementary. Back to the minister. The people of this province need to know that our government is listening and is working hard to enhance and restore public safety. Speaker, the federal government is sitting on their hands while terrorists sit in foreign jails waiting to return to our province. The Trudeau government has failed to act and has failed to take this issue with the urgency it requires. Speaker, we have had numerous people approach our government wanting to know whether a convicted terrorist can walk freely in our communities without any real consequences. To the minister, could you please explain to the members of this legislature the message our government for the people is sending to those terrorists who wish to return to Ontario? Minister. Mr. Speaker, the Trudeau government has had numerous chances to address this issue, but has continuously failed to do so. That's why our government, for the people, is taking the necessary steps to address this issue and ensure convicted terrorists understand that we are not going to welcome them back to this province with open arms. These convicted terrorists need to be charged for their barbaric acts upon their return to this province. No matter where in the world the act was committed, that is not what Canada, that is not what this province is all about. Once convicted, these terrorists do not deserve access to the privileges that the great province and the great people of this province are entitled to. Since Justin Trudeau doesn't seem to take this issue seriously, our government Response. is taking real action to send a message that there are serious consequences for having committed indefensible Thank you. Thank you. Next question, the member for Davenport. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. My question is to the Minister of Education. Mr. Speaker, the Ontario Physical and Health Education Association is a nonprofit organization that provides training and resources to support health and wellness initiatives in Ontario schools. Since 1921, the association has supported healthier, safer school communities by providing important learning resources for parents and teachers. Sadly, Mr. Speaker, as of last week, OFIA will no longer receive funding from the provincial government, another addition to this government's growing list of education cuts. Will the minister please explain why her government is so intent on keeping up-to-date health and wellness information out of the hands of our students? Minister. Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. You know, and I just want to refresh the memory of, uh, of the MPPs that were maybe not here in the last session. But the fact of the matter is that particular organization fought Ryan's law, and I just thought I'd share that wow. with everyone just wow. to put things in perspective. But Speaker, the fact of the matter is we're making sure that we're making investments that are making a difference for the learning environment in the classroom. And as we move forward, we're going to be looking at every line item to make sure that we are absolutely informing and supporting the best learning environment possible in this province. You know, we look forward to having organizations like OFIA participate in the consultation that we have going on because I love to speak about this organization uh, that we have created in terms of creating a forum for people to exercise their voice. Bots. All the collective voices coming together through our comprehensive consultation is going to make a difference for years to come. Thank you very much. Supplementary. Mr. Speaker, I wonder if the Minister of Education is talking about the consultation that they gave people four hours' notice to participate in. Yeah. Yes, comprehensive. Yes, great communication over there. Mr. Speaker, through you again to the Minister of Education. Just last week, we also revealed uh, that this government had quietly, without saying a word to parents, without saying a word to school boards, 
cut the parent engagement grants that so many of our schools, especially our low-income income schools, uh, depend upon. Now, this week, the government ends 16 years of support for OFIA. The latest cut means there will be fewer training opportunities for teachers, less availability of teaching resources, and a decrease in research and evidence sharing, all of which, Mr. Speaker, have been proven to be critical in student safety, Question. development, and well-being. Mr. Speaker, this government is slashing and cutting programs in our education system without letting anybody even know about it. When will this minister stop playing the blame game and start prioritizing the health? Thank you. Thank you. Minister. Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. You know, I welcome every opportunity to stand up and talk about the consultation we have going on sure, and sure. reinforce the fact that the sure. PC government on, on, of Ontario is standing up for teachers, standing up for parents, sure, and sure. most importantly, thinking about our students to make sure they're on the best path to success. Sure, sure. And, Speaker, I have to share with you that when we kicked off our latest phase of telephone town halls, you know what was most important? No matter what the information is coming across from across the aisle, which is wrong, but as most a matter of, time, of fact, yeah. most of the time, yeah. I have to tell you, people are starting off by saying thank you. Yeah. Thank you to for giving listening. us an thank opportunity to exercise our voice. Here, here. And Speaker, yeah. we're committed what to listening idea. to every single individual yeah. and organization yeah. that wishes to have their voice heard. No we are on response. the right track, and I look forward to sharing the results. Here, we look forward to Stop the clock. Start the clock. Next question, the member for Milton. Mr. Speaker, my question is for the Minister of Finance. The Select Committee on Financial Transparency has heard shocking testimony over the past two weeks. We heard from the Auditor General who the Liberals shut out in creating their accounting schemes. We heard from senior public servants who the Liberals ignored when making risky decisions. And yesterday, we heard from the Commissioner of the Independent Financial Commission of Inquiry whose hard work has put us on the path to ensure accountability and trust that can be restored. Could the minister please share his reflections on the witnesses the Select Committee of Financial Transparency has heard from so far? Minister Finance. Thank you, uh, Speaker, and thank you to the member from Milton. Each day the select committee, uh, that the Select Committee meets, uh, it provides another example of why we must restore accountability and trust. Last week, the committee heard from senior public servants who told us just how reckless the Liberals' decisions were. In a Liberal cabinet document, the risks the Liberals were willing to take became very clear. They were told, quote, borrowing money to defer electricity costs would lower costs in the short term but result in substantial debt and higher electricity prices in the future. They were also told that these, quote, associated risks and fiscal costs could put pressure on the province's credit rating and overall borrowing capacity. Speaker, the message is clear. The Liberals shut out the Auditor General. They ignored the warnings, warnings of the public servants. And now— Thank you. Supplementary. Thank you, Mr. Speaker, and thank you to the minister for his response. Through the Select Committee's meetings, I have also come to the same conclusion. The Liberals' rec recklessness was risky and irresponsible. It's time to restore accountability and trust. We've heard from those who tried to warn the previous Liberal government. We've heard from those who tried to hold them to account. Their efforts were ignored, and the people of Ontario are paying the price. Could the minister explain the importance of restoring accountability and trust in the province's finances? Minister. Thank you, Speaker. We must remember we are in unprecedented time in Ontario's history. The public's trust has been shattered. 
The previous government's accounting scheme was deliberately designed to keep the true costs of the Liberal spending off of the books. The Independent Financial Commission of Inquiry said multiple times that the average person would need a PhD in economics to understand the Liberals' accounting schemes. Yesterday, Commissioner Dr. Alan Rosen called the previous government's accounting, quote, misleading. This is unacceptable. We look forward to the Select Committee continuing their important work, and we will learn more about the Liberals' reckless spending decisions and hold those responsible to account for this misleading work. I'm going to ask the minister to withdraw. Withdraw. Next question. The Thank member for Brampton Centre. Minister of Finance, auto insurance premiums should not be based on your postal code, but yet it is. Residents from my Brampton North riding, for instance, are paying on average $1,000 more in auto insurance premiums than residents in the member's Nipissing riding. Wow. This, Mr. Speaker, is unfair. However, this government seems to be more focused bolstering the insurance industry than on eliminating postal code discrimination in auto insurance rates. Speaker, why is the minister more concerned with propping up the insurance industry than ensuring rates are affordable for drivers? Minister Finance. Well, uh, thank you, uh, Mr. Speaker. It's clear that the Liberal NDP system of failed stress go stretch goals on auto insurance is broken. Our government continues to look at the regulatory environment surrounding auto insurance in Ontario with the potential of allowing more competition in the marketplace. Now, obviously, Speaker, this opens the door for me to yet again congratulate our PC member from Milton for his important work on this file. Speaker, his proposed initiative is a great way to combat rate discrimination in our auto insurance system. Now that the member's legislation is tabled, we look forward to working with him and the industry stakeholders to ensure that our auto insurance system meets the needs of Ontario's 10 million drivers. Our member from Milton took the time to do it right. He consulted with stakeholders right across the province. He got it right. Stop the clock. Order. Start the clock. Supplementary. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. I guess we have to read between the lines because the key word there was potential. Potential for lowering auto insurance rates. So people from Brampton and uh, from Scarborough and other writings, that's the answer we're getting. Recently, the Financial Services Commission of Ontario approved yet another increase to auto insurance rates. While some Ontario drivers could see their rates increase almost 3%, others could see their rates go up as much as 11.6%. These increases will disproportionately impact residents in the Peel, Durham, Halton and York regions most. This is why we urgently need action, not potentially. GTA drivers are being targeted by insurance companies and this government needs to take a stance. Speaker, does this government believe that the GTA drivers should be paying more auto insurance than the rest of Ontario? Minister. Speaker, when I hear the member uh, talk about insurance rates going up, I'm pretty sure he's speaking about his own NDP member from Brampton East who wants the GTA to be considered a single geographic area when insurance companies set their rate. However, this will only serve to increase insurance costs across the entire GTA. Their members' plan would cause rates to rise in many of their own caucus colleagues right across their ridings. On the other hand, once again, pre uh, Speaker, the member from Milton, because he consulted, he got it right. We still have time for questions? Member for Bruce Gray Owen South. My question is for the Minister of Consumer and Government Services. 
After 15 years of Liberal reign, where we almost tripled the, de the debt to $335 billion, we were told it was going to be a $6 billion deficit, but it's actually a $15 billion deficit. This all enabled by the NDP government. Minister, can you tell us how the Ford PC government is going to open up Ontario for business? Oh. Yeah. House Leader. Speaker, I want to thank the government whip for that very well thought out and timely question this morning. As you may have heard, the Premier and a number of our ministers are in Scarborough this morning where they're announcing how we are going to get Ontario back on track to make Ontario the economic engine of Canada once again. And Speaker, you may have heard this, but our Premier has said at least once or twice, that Ontario is going to be open for business yeah, yeah, yeah. under a PC government. And you may have heard our Premier say this once or twice, Mr. Speaker. A new day has dawned in Ontario, and I can tell you that today's announcement, a new day has dawned in Ontario. That concludes the time we have for question period this morning. The member for Orléans. On a point of order, uh, a point of order, Mr. Speaker, I would like to welcome into the House uh, a friend and also my former chief of staff, Shane Gonzalez. He's a proud uh, new father of a. Uh, I think what a couple of weeks, a month, a month old uh, baby son, Sebastian. So we would like to welcome him and wish him the very best with his birth of his son. Mr. Bruce Gray, on sound. Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. I'd like to, on behalf of everyone in this House, uh, congratulate the member from Flamborough Grand Book, Grand Book on her Glenbrook. birthday today. Flamborough. 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 Children, Community and Social Services. Thank you very much, Speaker. I'd just like to remind all members tomorrow is Child Abuse Prevention Month, and I encourage all members of this assembly to wear purple in solidarity with children who are suffering child abuse. I wish to inform the House that uh, later on I'm going to be attending uh, an event to recognize uh, long service uh, employees of the legislature with their awards, the long service award reception, and I was hoping that you would join me in, in uh, an ovation to celebrate and, and express our thanks to the long serving members of, of the staff of the Ontario Legislature. And I will be there to pass along everyone's best wishes. There being no deferred votes, being no deferred votes, this House stands in recess till 3 o'clock this afternoon.